It's never too late, but the earlier you start, the faster the ROI will happen and you could be the one to disrupt your competitor by new ways of engagement, new ways of thinking and Spryker is here to make that motion work. Welcome to the Agile Digital Transformation Podcast, where we explore different aspects of digital transformation and digital experience with your host, Tim Butera, Content and Community Manager at Agile Drop. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Our guest today is Edmund Frey, Chief Revenue Officer of the Germany-based Spryker Systems. They're the producers of the Spryker Cloud Commerce OS. We have a really great topic for you today, and it's one that we've all definitely experienced and been affected by in this past year. Today, Edmund and I will be discussing the explosion of e-commerce due to the COVID pandemic. Welcome, Edmund. It's really great to have you as our guest today. Anything we should add before we dive into the questions? Yeah, thanks for having me, Tim. Uh, I super look forward to such a pretty, pretty present topic uh, to go over it. And of course, um, Spryker plays a pivot role also in, in supporting in times like, like this. So uh, eager to, to discuss um, and, and let's see where, where your questions will, will take mm -hmm. us on this one. So nothing to add on the entrance. Let, let's just roll into the conversation, I think. Awesome. I'm also really excited about this particular topic. And it's been one that I've had on my mind uh, basically ever since we started the podcast. But I wanted somebody who has, who's is really an expert and has experience in e-commerce. So I'm really glad you're the guy for this. Thanks for the flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so let's begin with a short look into the history of e-commerce. Was there any particular moment or like, like an event that kind of changed the course of e-commerce? It changed how people view it. An interesting question. I think to answer that one, it's a bit tough to say like a particular event. So I, mm -hmm. at least I can't point to, to one. Um, I'm in the industry since the early 2000s. And I remember at my times with BA, where BA um, was a J2E infrastructural app server uh, where where there was the idea born to standardize the, the commerce and bring the internet in a shoppable moment with the product WebLogic commerce back in the days. I remember where I was sitting with a, a catalog uh, retailer um, back in the days where I tried to sell him the, the way forward that he's able to leapfrog, bring, bring his client uh, the same experience uh, also online in the internet. And he said to me back in the days, uh, Eddie, you're you're young, you're ambitious. I understand you, but you have to see our customers are catalog customers. Five years later, they went bankrupt because of the <laughs> So maybe there was a, a particular moment in my life to so understand not everybody um, believes in what's to come. And now looking backward, we all know what happened. I think with Amazon at the mm -hmm. at the forefront, um, betting all horses on online, coming from books to to marketplace to to all the wares. Now uh, they was 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 prime, was fresh. I think they they're conquering, as we all know, the, the, the everything which can be 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 sold online. They gained the trust. They they made it easy to be found with. They uh, understood that the internet has to be used as a full service and uh, to thrive forward. I think that as people understood more and more, was was how commerce has changed. Um, so no real particular event, as we talk later about Corona or COVID, I think that that is an event of acceleration. Mm -hmm. But till then, it was just people um, of, of, of several ages, different verticals also found and copied concepts. Uh, and I think it's just, it's here to stay. It's just accelerating on the way forward. Definitely. Yep, I definitely agree. And actually, that's a good example of Amazon, you know, since Amazon is is the player in the e-commerce industry, you know, the, the main name, you know, b b basically some people don't even order anything of any other size. They just get everything from Amazon. So I think that that definitely was a kind of first milestone, so to speak. But you also correctly pointed out that probably an even more important milestone was the COVID pandemic, which we're, ex we're still experiencing now. But uh, maybe before we move on to that, I'm interested in, you know, these, these were kind of the two big things that, that helped uh, the, with the adoption and acceleration of e-commerce. But were there any other factors in the development of e-commerce and uh, the development of the web and tech in general that contributed to it? Yeah, I think when, when we look 
just e-commerce it's a bit a bit narrow i'd say also when you talk to an insurance company or a bank and you want to you want to um you want to have them lean into e-commerce um they will not adopt to it because they they the word commerce always is like selling goods to someone uh at least uh in, in the area um of, of of the markets i oversee so the uh, I think looking a bit more broadly and how the internet evolved, there was the web one zero, which it was primarily where in the beginning of 2000s, where companies had to enter the web. It was more a representative website, uh, like a business card. Like, this is mm-hmm. my company, this is my business, call me or fax me, maybe even back in the days. <laughs> um, and web 2.0 uh, were arising, uh, or in the beginning, there were a lot of players like search engines, um, applications found a way, and also with the introduction of mobile phone, uh, mm-hmm. with, with, with smartphones, uh, 2007, I think till 2010, we saw a big, big shift uh, where the web content management uh, had to go more omni-channel, I'd say, or multi-channel it was back in the days, not so much evolving commerce to the forefront, but it was already there, uh, uh, significant, but just supporting let's say the local storefront um, and, and, and bring commerce to the forefront. Today, Web 2.0 has been uh, seen as uh, the GAFAs. So basically, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Google uh, are the main entry portals. Mm-hmm. So it really, uh, really accelerated down to, to, the, to, the big, to the big players to, to rule how we use the internet today and also then how you find somebody to make, to make a sale or, or to, to, to find the commerce transactional uh, uh, applications. I, I think forward-looking, we uh, might touch it a bit later, Web 3.0 is on the forefront where we free up ourselves, also get out of the browsers, get out of the, the app stores to download uh, uh, only the apps Google and, and Apple allows us to with PWA in front end as a service, as trend technologies. But looking to this from, from the development side, I think there was several stages where commerce played a pivotal role of of, of easier to use, where there was more the catalog type of browsing mm-hmm. and ordering, uh, it really got more based on, on search to find things. Um, and then uh, I think with the rise of social, uh, there was a different notion coming to play. So every new channel put on top of commerce and digital has, has driven shifts in, in where people buy, how people buy and how commerce was, was rising its, its uh, importance. Uh, for the companies to drive businesses. And as said, retail mainly, but we also see it uh, in other verticals now, uh, nowadays. Um, I was just talking about insurances, how Lemon.com has changed their uh, complete way, or Airbnb, that service wouldn't exist mm-hmm. with a internet and commerce platform to disrupt the, the area of, of, of uh, hospitality. Or take a Netflix, uh, how they disrupted the normal uh, uh, broadband television Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of I consume when I want and how I want um, uh, and what I want uh, type of offering. So you're not called a commerce, but that's also transactional businesses, which is part of commerce. Yeah. So uh, I think goods, services, or or things I, I was just mentioning are, are blend in to, to the motion and it won't stop here. We're just in the midst of, of the, the mm-hmm. shift into the online world. Those are some very, very good points, yeah, Edmund. It's it's exactly that, right? It's 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 a topic that's actually I, I thought that the explosion of e-commerce due to the pandemic was a broad topic, but it's 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 not broad enough to cover everything, you know. As as you as you rightly pointed out, it's things like Netflix subscriptions, which can't be rightly called commerce, but we still saw a massive rise with them basically alongside all the all the milestones that you mentioned, you know, the improvement of the web, uh, mm-hmm. the improvement of how people interact with it, uh, mobile, always on, stuff like that. So, yeah, that's. I think that's a discussion for another time. Uh, l- let's just focus on, on our topic for today. And as you said, we're going to be talking about uh, how the future of e-commerce and, and these kinds of services will look like uh, in a post-COVID uh, world. But uh, let's jump back a bit and focus on the current pandemic and what was going on. And, you know, you as Spryker, you're experts in e-commerce. You probably have a lot of partners and clients who turn to you for these services. Uh, how have you seen these partners and clients being affected by this rise in e-commerce? And more, more importantly, even how did you act on it? 
That is a broad question with a, a lot of points. Um, so uh, let me take first what, what we saw and I think nobody planned was, mm -hmm. was the pandemic. Nobody could foresee and still foresee how things are, are going forward. So I remember because I, I started just a month before the pandemic really hit the society um, with full fledged. I started with Spreaker in the beginning of February. Um, I, I remember because I was traveling the Asian, uh, even Hong Kong uh, back in the days mm -hmm. of January where the first case has been, been, uh, been found. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I started with a normal 30, 60, 90 days plan when you take on uh, a businesses with the focus of aligning to the right verticals, aligning the team, uh, go, go forward with scale. Um, with March, with the lockdown, nothing what was planned could be executed in the way, I think. So it, it, it's now clear and the first programs we were, we were looking at is, yeah, who, who are winners or losers? Um, and, and loser is a hard word, but definitely now we know there's a lot of, um, a lot of verticals um, where travel, hospitality um, and, 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 and others did see, and retail in special with all the lockdowns, uh, did, uh, are super under pressure. Uh, and that, that kind of was foreseeable. So we, we, we checked in with the analysts, we checked in with, with, uh, with our client base uh, and, and, and yeah, had to adopt to that, you know, to support that motion. Basically, I, I, I think from, from that point, now we are more than one year into this theme. Uh, I also know because 15th of March was my birthday and is my birthday. So I was having the last party before we had to shut down and it's uh, almost again at the next week, uh, two weeks from now on. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's really a year in. So we, we can look back, but we also can look forward. So, and your question is more about what, what happened the last year. And mm -hmm. um, I think clear winners are, are the ones who, who were able to adopt fast enough. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, look into to the IT stack some companies have and uh, adopt fast enough means you have to use what is the only channel you have available in a lockdown. It's online, right? So not every every vertical or every everyone, especially in, in the DACH area, um, was prepared to do so. So uh, I, 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 we saw a lot of customers um, reaching out to, to our partners and ourselves, like how can we bridge the gap? So like a car manufacturer, for instance, they have a great main site. They could see the spike of people coming on the site, sitting at home at the couch, browsing over their property, but they had no store attached to this mm -hmm. to sell the cars they have in, in, the, in, 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 their, in their dealers, right? And even there, there was a dislink between the dealer and, and the main page because there was always the like, um, we don't want to take business away from dealers or, or, or let's not mix it up. Pandemic changed the game. So um, that's that's one of the the great examples I, I think where we we could with a modular system we have built and bridge the needs between the own properties. So we're headless. We uh, could integrate easily to the web stack, mm -hmm. and with uh, being modular, we could also integrate the dealers um, together with the marketplace um, uh, modules we got. And in, in just three weeks, we from first touch. We launched that site to be live. People could reserve their car and, and buy the car online, um, which then after the lockdown could could be, could be grabbed. Um, and so they, they, they even accelerated the businesses instead of slowing down by that motion. And there's, there's other examples where, where um, clearly in B2B, uh, where it was not just you cannot go with a sales rep to your client and you have to use online channels, you have to use... I don't know, LinkedIn or other social media to, to get uh, in contact with, with your clients, uh, but also the supply chain has been broken because of, mm -hmm. of, of a lockdown country and stuff like that. So we've seen a lot of requests uh, in this area to support, to support them with um, the heavy systems they had. They couldn't change the supply chains fast enough. Uh, so um, Spryker, uh, as modular as we are, um, and having uh, the, 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 the right, the right uh, understanding of what to do in an agile way, we could repair and support them to bring uh, manufacturing home uh, to integrate with, with, with the systems agile and fast um, to, to kind of mitigate um, the shortfalls here from the IT side. So great, great examples. Maybe one more, uh, a sport retailer who is buying goods uh, and typically they meet every quarter with the vendors they buy from in person. So what, 
what was the request we solved uh, also in a two weeks uh, project um, again very agile and lean that they can meet all the vendors online uh, exchange the goods they uh, will need to purchase to to be able to to not miss out a season so uh, that's how they could at least act to the summer um, to have the price negotiated to to you know, to have their their shelf uh, being built and that one I, I'm pretty proud we brought forward in such a fast in an innovative way. It's never been done before. So uh, Spiker could help together with with, with partners um, how how that could, problem could be solved. So a lot of pandemic cost problem statements where speed is everything. Having a modular system like Spiker to only install, to only bring into the project what is needed um, to also get down um, the, the level of of, of maintainable uh, system in the end, uh, that was that was uh, things we could help with the pandemic. Then on the other hand, we clearly see um, a, a, a further need, which which went along all the year, year uh, in terms of ever locked retails. Um, so click and collect is uh, something mm-hmm. which is absolutely the only way how you can still combine, uh, let's say, a personal touch to your client which is a mix of online order and uh, personal takeaway. So we've seen that motion. In the US, it's called curbside delivery. Um, we already started such a project together with uh, a do-it-yourself store. We had all the components on our modular commerce platform, which, yeah, we could uh, help big discounter uh, here in Germany to, to, to bridge that gap because they've never thought they want to have such a solution. In four and a half weeks, we build it next to Mm-hmm. To, to their IT stack and help them out. And now we've seen that several uh, other projects to adopt to what we have uh, and, and drive, drive that forward. So uh, I think I have tons of other examples, but it always comes down to how Spriker and especially our ecosystems with partner can, can help or how we helped and we will help is uh, to bring forward what is the problem statement to build and adopt in an agile way and to build from there and scale it to the enterprise. So there's no need to wait. There's no need to make a big project for commerce with a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of people involved. You can uh, start with Spiker on a small scale and then to, to roll it out globally. You can really um, bring what you've built MVP by MVP step-by-step step in an agile way uh, to, to then uh, a full-fledged system in the end. So. I think that was what the pandemic showed pretty significantly because people went off the normal trails. It means mm-hmm. to do a brutal, long government go- governance project to, to spec out every nuts and bolt uh, to go off the waterfall way of thinking and behaving into very fast and agile ways. I think we've seen that several times and it's continuing like this. And this is where Spryker fits in very, very well, um, being uh, a very modern and modular platform to, to fulfill that, that kind of motion, I say. Awesome, yeah, well said. Agility and speed are definitely the name of the game in a time when everything moves so fast. And when there, if everybody is on the web, you know, if everybody's selling web, uh, stuff on the web, that means that your competition is probably also moving fast, right? So if, if not for other reasons, then you at least have to move fast because you don't want to be uh, outsmarted by your competition, right? So it makes perfect sense that you should focus yeah, on absolutely. speed. Absolutely, although uh, it's interesting. There, there wasn't so much like, what is my competitor doing? Uh, it's really like, get get the, the, the supply chain, the, the downstream and upstream and order in B2B. Mm-hmm. Or as mentioned, I, I can't even reach my my customers anymore. So to bridge the gap, to go online, um, especially, and that's why I had a hard time to answer your first question. Uh, I, I think in the Dach area, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, we are a bit behind still on, on the online topic. I, I know a lot of brands are not bringing them forward where they're still hesitant to bet online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen statements like, yeah, online is a good channel. That's clear. 10%, 20% is what we will drive through. That has been waived through pandemic. Now Mm -hmm. there is only online and they've been late to the game altogether, not just one. And it's it's not to look what is the competitor doing. It's like, all right, we have to get the thing going. And I think that's the good news. Uh, And this is what propelled the Spriker, of course, 
uh, in our partner ecosystem uh, because you're also etching then how, how much can you deliver at the same time, you know, uh, because everybody is, is now starting to, to do what they should have done the last two or three years in a normal motion in a rush, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, of course, it's also if you not do it, but your competitor does it. That also swings in, but it's not the high priority from what I see. It's more, what's the new normal later yeah. on? Yeah. What's the new normal? Uh, everybody says, like, when pandemic is gone, how should the world look like? Then the competitor, if he was smarter and he was faster and he's already modernized his deck, I think this is where a trouble lays ahead of people who got hit by a pandemic. Most of the verticals are, don't, don't make their normal revenue, I'd say. So you, you have a double hit. Yeah, you lost mm -hmm. revenues in 2020 and your competitor has maybe outsmarted, outpaced you by online is now there. You will not catch up uh, if you're not um, also done the same thing. But nobody's really thinking, not to say nobody, but I, I still see a lot are more for themselves than looking left and right at the moment. And another thing that, that, that I assumed is that, you know, since customer experience is a huge part of business, a huge part of e-commerce, uh, I would assume that with the rise of e-commerce, with the rise of the digitalization, it would also make sense that that digital customer experience is becoming more and more important. Like, are you seeing any major CX trends arising due to this rise in e-commerce? And what do you think the key aspects of CX are now with e-commerce being kind of the, the main player? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. I think, first of all, uh, custom experience is not pure digital, right? So it is a play of all channels and everything a customer experiences with a brand, right? And I go that far that custom experience is also too short in uh, how to look at it. So um, you find myself uh, talking about uh, really experience management as such. So it's really about... Mm -hmm the holistic view also how is the employee feeling along with this on the other side because when you have a human touch whether it's like we talk right now whether it's on channels um chatboting are are trends i see um on on how to get faster reaction and and also to kind of lean manage cost and efficiency but in a way a customer feels feels at home um so that that experiences are also part and then interesting enough there's one measurement out there which works very nicely, which is the star ranking. Yeah, so uh, people will leave their comments how they feel. People will give you a ranking how they feel, and um, I think every everybody in the industry should be aware that this is the measure, the ultimate measurement, publicly outside and not even on your own property, where you might be able to tweak to delete a comment or I don't know, uh, kill some of the stars. <laughs> Nobody will do this officially, but uh, just to get a better outside view. But if you don't own the property, you, you have to live with what social has been collecting about experience ranking. Talking about the five-star experience, it's simple to understand when I ask you the question, uh, you go on TripAdvisor and a hotel is ranked with three stars only. Would you book that hotel? Or think of, an, uh, of a car ride with, with Uber. If a rider is ranked three stars, would you enter that mm -hmm. car? I think you wouldn't, right? So that's how you need to think of how experience has found the ranking and it is very well used. So everybody should go for the five-star ranking. And we talked about Amazon. I think they do very good. I, I wouldn't give them the, the stamp for having the most beautiful designed web page or Amazon uh, does targeting well. Yeah, when I bought a monitor, I still get advertisement on uh, various channels about that fact. So I'm, I'm not going there that the customer experience uh, is great in the way how glossy and, and nice their digital property is. But the overarching promise mm -hmm. that you deliver a full fledged service in the best way that includes the understanding of who the customer is. It includes the trust you will deliver the goods I'm ordering. It will also include, if I don't like it, I can send it back and there's no hassle to get my money back. Or if something breaks in a year from now and somebody will take care in terms of services. I think this is the holistic customer experience. And that takes a digital to be employee and connect to the real world on every single customer touch point where you need to have the customer profile ready. You have to have your systems connected to each other from the marketing towards the selling and the servicing of the goods. And you also have 
to get the data right. So basically, if that play is, is in charge, you're halfway there. Um, and then why is the spiker so important in that mix? Uh, we see us in the in the center of, of connecting the dots being the transactional business platform for operating system. Uh, I already meant the word commerce doesn't go along for all the verticals, right? So it's really about having your having a system at heart where you can connect all the dots to do the digital transformation uh, based on, on, on transactional uh, business models. You also want to have a flexible system like Spriker to try out new ways of engagement of a customer, whether it's business models, whether it's to have a marketplace attached on the same platform to add services you not own yourself, but you can sell along with your goods or with your services. Um, that gives gives you uh, the proper platform to, to maximize the customer experience or how I'd say to go for the five-star rankings all the way. So that def definitely a good point. Uh, so you ask me also what trends I see in terms of uh, customer experience on, on the forefront. Um, we already uh, briefly strived the, the topics of social commerce. Um, commerce come to mail, so you might be able in the very near future to order goods within an email, which is tailored to your needs. We also see um, Alexa or, or other voice systems um, taking on the markets. So voice commerce is something very, very critical. Um, people need to think about because thinking about customer experience in the voice commerce, for instance, uh, I always like the questions, um, how do you ensure your brand is still relevant when somebody wanna sell whatever, batteries, for instance. If you say, hey, Alexa, order me some batteries, you know what you will get? You will get Amazon essential batteries. So how do you ensure uh, Alexa asks you, just to give you some brand names, uh, what batteries do you like? This is where the brand has to be in, in the mind. You not see any content uh, like storytelling marketing or content marketing. So that question is of a sense that you can answer with brands. Um, what batteries you like, Varta or Duracell? Uh, that could be a totally different type of engagement because when you said, I don't want essentials, you send it back to be weaving in in the next time you talk and have the same similar order to give more options, right? So I think um, there's a lot of things in that space we have to find out how we engage best as human beings with, with commerce to the system. And again, here you need a modular way to test out in real time what works uh, and what doesn't. And then there will be one major driver, I think, which is in the automotive industry. We still talk about futuristic stuff that we see autonomous driving. But if we have it, it will be a game changer because you will sit in a, in, in, in a kind of living room area for quite a while if you commute to your workspace or if you're traveling just for leisure, um, this is free time we've never had it in our hands. And I think in this area, advertisement, in this area, commerce, in this area, voice to commerce, because you will not have a keyboard in a car you would enter, will, will, will be one of the biggest new growth area for commerce. And I think who got that right will, will, will be, we see a great, great new market for themselves. Yeah, It's a bit futuristic, but it's not that far out, I would say. It's like the example I had in the very beginning. If I now pitch that to somebody who has catalog customer, you might tell me there will always be self-driving cars because it's fun to ride a car. But the truth is um, th there will be a big change. And I think that's a big, big uh, new topic to customer experience as such. Well, we already kind of covered uh, a topic related to the future of commerce in a post-COVID world. So... I'll just move on to the final question that I have for you. And this one is more practical, maybe directed to those listeners who maybe have some challenges with, with you know, implementing e-commerce or who are, who are worried that they missed the mark because they didn't get into the game and get online fast enough. So I want to ask you as a final question, is it already too late for marketers and decision makers to kind of capitalize on this boom in e-commerce? And what would you say to, to people that want to capitalize on it, that want to get into it, but uh, haven't yet done it? Yeah, very good question. Uh, the short answer, it's never too late. As we always see, and there's one rule in the internet, there is no borders. Don't sink in countries, right? Mm -hmm. And 
the smallest company, look at Netflix or the examples we already scratched today, the smallest can interrupt or disrupt significantly because of the fact size doesn't matter and there's no borders in the internet. And yeah, definitely uh, it's never too late. As I said, uh, we see big trends, which is uh, in the era of marketplace, right? Um, I already mentioned it. It's part of our Spryker platform and offering. So you can easily test out what else on services you want to offer with a third party vendor management, easy adoptable um, to sell it as a white label or sell it through or even build marketplaces without your own goods to test out markets, to test out enhancement like I call infinity shelf, right? So you can build an infinity shelf by technology and to, to test new waters, not maybe in your home market, but also in some other countries. Why not? I think we all got the tools and the borders to get something started are not too big. And from cost, it's 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 also not too big if you, if you consider it in an agile way, as I described it. So uh, definitely not too late. Um, our ecosystem, ourselves, we are eager. As I mentioned, we have companies, we have, uh, uh, customers or prospects coming at us with a problem statement and we, we are always ready to to rumble <laughs> if we also say no to something uh, if it doesn't fit our heritage yeah but if it's a complex sophisticated uh, problem uh, to be solved by a business transactional commerce platform uh, we are ready to support with ideation we are ready to support with our partners together of how a fast check out uh, could could work like um, to also um, calculate the business case to it and, and drive it drive it forward and test the waters right and then it's a crawl work run where, where mm -hmm. failure is your constant um, um, partner I'd say you learn from fail and you create something big out of this and this is where we see uh, companies we work with to to start small and scale to multiple triple uh, digit million businesses even up to the billions from from an MVP state. This is absolutely possible. And again, it's never too late, but the earlier you start, the faster the ROI will happen. And you could be the one to disrupt your competitor by new ways of engagement, new ways of thinking, and Spryker is here to make that motion work. Awesome, some very motiva motivational advice right there at the end. Uh, great way to close the episode, Edmund. Uh, just before we finish, if people want to reach out to you to learn more about you or Spryker, what's the best place for them to do that? Yeah, fun enough, LinkedIn has really uh, mutated to be one of the best ways to engage, uh, not just for me, but when I talk to colleagues or partners, similarly. So you will find me as Edmund, uh, Edmund Fry, who is in Spryker, a CRO. Uh, drop me a PN there, uh, on the other hand. I uh, also eager uh, to, to put forward our great website, uh, which is also a good resource to learn more about us in the first place. And of course, uh, we have a contact form there um, and who are our partners, uh, what are use cases we, we achieved. So uh, feel free to also go, go there if you don't want to reach out direct to me to, to check in on Spryker a bit more and learn uh, what, what we could do for you or together with you. And just a small closing statement. It's not you choose technology, it's more. It's you choose technology, you choose a methodology, how you wanna test out things and build things, and you need a strong partner to support you uh, with that factor. And um, I, I think that's the examples we have. And uh, yeah, looking forward on, on connections through the podcast. Uh, what I hear, I hear back also on feedback, personal. Uh, is my thinking right? Uh, is my view right? Uh, it's not about right or wrong, but like what is, what your uh, users and listeners are, 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 are uh, having as reactions to, to my a bit bold statement, maybe in one or the other corner. Uh, I'd like to discuss that further beyond the podcast. So feel free to reach out to me. LinkedIn is the best way. Awesome. Awesome closing note, Edmund. Thank you so much for being our guest today and for sharing these awesome and, as you said, maybe bold insights. But, you know, it, it's better to have more bold insights. You don't want to be the guy who, who just... Uh, plays it super safe and doesn't want to say anything that might be controversial. I think I think it will make for a more valuable ep episode. The fact that we had both statements, as you pointed it out. Thanks again, Edmund, and to our listeners. That's all for this episode. Have a great day, everyone, and stay safe. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to check out our other episodes, you can find all of them at agiledrop.com/podcast.
as well as on all the most popular podcasting platforms. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes, and don't forget to share the podcast with your friends and colleagues.